you will, take your Bible and look with me in Isaiah chapter 59. It was not my intent to follow through chapter after chapter here since Isaiah 55, but that's the way the Lord has directed, just because this is so profound. So we'll look at Isaiah 59, and then next week 60, and see how the Lord directs from there. But I've entitled this message, Sin and Salvation. What would be salvation were it not for sin? And what would be sin were it not for salvation? Well, the answer to that is, were there not salvation for sinners, there would be no hope for any. The fact that God has purposed to save sinners such as we are is by his grace and mercy alone. He doesn't owe it. But oh, when you understand the glory of his grace, how brightly then the salvation that is in the Lord Jesus Christ shines. And what would be salvation without sin? A lot of people say, well, why did God create the world? And often you'll hear people say, permit the fall. Well, nowhere in scripture does it say he permitted the fall. He ordained it. And he ordained it because he had already purposed that his son should be the savior of that number of sinners that he had chosen even before the foundation of the world and given to him that he should come into this world and pay the sin debt. And so here in Isaiah 59, Isaiah is preaching in a very troublesome time. He preached and proclaimed God's judgment to the ten tribes of the north that, would, that were taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And toward the end, he is prophesying a judgment of God that would be by the hand of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that would take place hundred-some years after the initial Assyrian judgment, captivity. And so all the way through is nothing but judgment. And it's in the backdrop then of this sin and idolatry that God is pointing out that we see this promise of salvation, not to everybody. A lot of people today get that wrong. They think that God wants everybody to be saved. Well, if that were the case, what kind of God is he then that not everybody's saved? If God can will something and it not come to pass. What kind of God is that? Not the sovereign God. That's a little G-O-D. So today in Isaiah 59, I'd like to draw our attention to this powerful chapter in the book of Isaiah that really resonates with timeless truth. Isaiah wrote this about 500 years before Christ. Here we are in the year 2023. And yet, what we read here is just as vital and important for us today as it was in Isaiah's day. Because Isaiah is speaking to the condition of fallen sinners. I hear people say all the time, man, it just seems like things are getting worse and worse. Well, go back and read your Bible. It's been bad from the beginning, even in the days of Noah. The thoughts of the generation were only continually toward evil, is the way it's written there in Genesis 6. And so that's why this chapter is vital, to show us the gravity of, of sin, what it is to be fallen sinners. Most people you talk to today, they kind of shrug their shoulders and say, oh, well, aren't we all sinners? They treat it so lightly. In fact, they treat that more lightly than they would a prognosis or diagnosis from a doctor telling them that they've got terminal cancer. That's where people kind of kick into high gear and think, oh, no, the C word. Well, 
How about the S word, sin? And we'll see here just how Isaiah deals with this, really with two vital subjects. The first one, the sobering reality of the brokenness of this world because of the fall. Some people think that we're just bruised by the fall. No, the fall ushered all of Adam's seed and race into complete condemnation and death. So we see the sobering reality of the brokenness of a world that is in a fallen state. But secondly, and that's why the title of this message, Sin and Salvation, this chapter also points us to the hope of redemption that is found in a God who is both just and loving. See, a lot of people like to talk about God's love. He is love, but he loves according to his righteous standard. He can't just love arbitrarily. And that's where we see the significance of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and that purposed salvation. In the Old Testament, it was looking forward to his coming and the New Testament looks back to his coming, but the Lord Jesus Christ is God's Savior, is the subject and focus of all of Scripture, but particularly we're going to see that here in Isaiah 59. Over in Psalm 85 and verses 10 and 11. There's a key verse there that speaks of why the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was necessary for the salvation of sinners. God purposed a fallen world, yes, but he doesn't just now look the other way to forgive sinners. The reason he purposed a fallen world was to honor and glorify his son as the savior. But for the son to come and do this work of salvation. In Isaiah 85 and verses 10 and 11. We read mercy and truth are met together. Do you think of God's mercy? Yes, he's a merciful God to save. But always in accord with the truth or with justice. Justice had to be satisfied in order for him to show mercy. So mercy and truth are met together. These are talking about God's attributes. And then righteousness and peace have what? Kissed each other. His righteousness, when it was satisfied by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we find in scripture. That he came and earned and established that righteousness. And... Thereby, God is just to justify, declare righteous upon completion of Christ's work, those sinners for whom he died. That's how righteousness and peace, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. It's the way it's put there in Romans 5. We're justified by his death, but by faith, that revelation of Christ in the heart by the Spirit, we enter into the joy of what Christ accomplished and the peace that's been established already by him. And you can see in verse 11, it says, truth shall spring out of the earth. What's that talking about? Well, that's talking about Christ coming as a man. From this earth, God would cause his truth to spring out. Think of a plant that's planted and grows up, a tree of life. And righteousness shall look down from heaven. What's that talking about? That's talking about God approving everything his son did. That's why he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear he him. So truth springing up from the ground. That's the person and work of Christ. Righteousness looking down from heaven. God the father approving the sacrifice of his son. You may ask, well, how do we know he's approved it? Well, he raised him from the grave. And now he's ascended on high where he sits at the right hand of the Father. And 
that he lives to ever intercede on behalf of those that the Father gave him. So in Isaiah 59, we see this twofold approach. We encounter a true heartfelt lamentation as the prophet Isaiah poignantly describes the dire state of his day. And much of what he said about his day could be said about our day. And he highlights the pervasive, not only presence of sin and injustice and moral decay of his time, but how it's like a fastidious cancer, gangrene, growing. And yet, in all of this, this bleak context, we see toward the end of the chapter how he was caused to look to Christ himself. And also for that remnant, there was a remnant that God had purposed to save even in his day. Not all would be destroyed. That's God's mercy. Even if God shows mercy to one sinner and condemns the rest, that's mercy. But he presents to us this true hope, a message of true hope, not a hope so hope. Emphasizing to begin with here in verse 1 that God's arm is not too short to save, nor his ear too deaf to hear the cries of sinners. See, people assume, well, it must be that the problem may be with God then, because if he wants everybody to save, to be saved, and yet not everybody's saved, that must mean that sin is too powerful for God. No, that sort of thinking does not represent the God of Scripture. Indeed, it would be true that if God wanted everyone to be saved, and Christ died to save everybody, but not everybody is saved, and the Spirit now is going about trying to get people to come to Christ and yet not all come, what does that say then about salvation? It means that God's will must not have anything to do with salvation. It means that Christ's death must not have anything to do with salvation. It means that the Spirit's work must not have anything to do with salvation. Ultimately then you have to say it comes down to man. It's up to man. That's not the salvation of Scripture that we find. Now, we find a sovereign God who actually saves everyone that he has purposed to save, and that those that Christ has redeemed, of those he'll not lose one. That's my comfort to know there are none in hell for whom Christ died, and that the Spirit isn't going about trying to get sinners to turn to Christ. No, he's drawing them. And it's the Spirit's work so to do. Just like Christ said to Nicodemus, the Spirit is like the wind that blows where it wills. And you can't tell where it's coming or where it's going. Such is that concerning those that are born of God. So let's look at Isaiah 59 together. And may the very Spirit of God himself give us understanding of the profound relevance of this portion for our lives today. I don't want to speak to people just in general, but if you're listening, I pray the Lord will address this word to your heart even as he has mine. This is not just some historic study about Isaiah's day or God's dealings with Israel in the past. Now here we have a very powerful message of God's forgiveness and grace toward the worst of sinners. Sin and salvation. We're not talking about just being slightly sinful, but completely depraved and fallen. And yet a God who is pleased to save such. And how he is just. He does it in a just way to justify those sinners by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's begin here in verse 1. And here we see our sinfulness as God sees it. 
That's what's vital. It doesn't matter what men think of it. But what does God say about our sinfulness? In verse 1, he declares, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities. And that word iniquity is really the word inequity. Everything that is contrary to right and justice, that's what iniquity is, inequity. There's nothing in us that is just. And it's your iniquities that have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So the problem isn't, number one, we've got to get this straight from the beginning, that somehow God's hand is too short that he cannot save, that the problem is too big with God. I know that we may wonder sometimes when we look at the world and even our own hearts, why God doesn't just completely remove the sin. Well, he's purposed and done so in the work of his son for his people. He has delivered them from the curse of sin, but we await the day when we will be free from the very presence of sin. And that's going to be when these bodies are raised in newness of life and will be in that glorified state forever like our, our Lord Jesus Christ. But you can imagine the people in Isaiah's day looking around and everything taking place and wondering, where is God? That's what people like to do. The first they like to blame is God. And yet, here our Lord makes it very clear that the problem is not with him. Had God purposed, to save every single sinner in the world, that sin would not have been too significant or important for him to do. It's not that his hand is not is short, that he cannot save, nor is hear his ear heavy. Notice how that's put, that it cannot hear. They thought, as they continued in the day, thinking the more we pray, then God's going to hear and intervene, and then we'll be delivered. We won't have to worry about judgment. That's like people today gather for these prayer seances, and they think that somehow prayer changes things. It's the way it's put. No, God is the one who determines all things and causes his people to cry unto him that his will be done. They're not trying to get God to do anything, change anything. So the problem is not with God, but it's with the people. Now, again, we're looking at how God sees sinfulness. There in verse 2, your iniquities have separated you from your God. The problem isn't with God's power to save. It's not with his knowledge or his intent. The problem is with iniquities. Sin has separated you from God your God. And that goes all the way back to the fall. There are none that are born in this world in a right state as far as their lives are concerned. We are born sinners. David said he came forth from the womb speaking lies. But in what way does sin separate us from God? It doesn't necessarily separate us from his presence as if God now must remove himself. No, we know from scripture, God is everywhere present. And we know that sin does not separate us even from God's purpose and will on our behalf. He's directing all things. Here, the separation has to do with separation from his blessings. And separation from the enjoyment of what it is to be reconciled to a holy God. 
as sinners. And that's why only God can reconcile. This separation has to do with a holy God and coming short of the glory of God. It's the way that Paul puts it there in Romans chapter 3. And only God then can reconcile because he's the offended party. He's the offended judge. And sinners are at his mercy. And so the Lord reminds the people here, reminds us that it is our iniquities, notice, that have separated between you and your God. Paul wrote it and said there in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When you look that in the Greek, the tense of it is all did sin and come short of the glory of God. Well, when did all sin at one time? In Adam, when he fell, just like here, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Have separated. This is a separation that had already taken place. And therefore, he says, your sins have hid his face from you. When it says hid his face from you, it doesn't mean that he's no longer aware or no longer looking. But in... This sense hid his face as far as him showing mercy and grace. Were God to simply leave any of us in this state of separation before him, then there would be no mercy. But our sins have hid his face from us that he will not hear. He'll not hear based on us approaching him. He's the offended party. He'll not hear based on what we may bring before him. This is why there's a need for the mediator. And that's what this is leading up to. That without the mediator, without God having purposed the salvation for those sinners that he's purposed to save, there would be no salvation. Such as the gravity of our sin and our sinfulness. And so here in verses 3 through 8, still looking at how God looks upon our sinfulness, we have a very detailed description of the sins as God sees them. Let's just read this, verse 3 to 8. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Now, before we get too far, don't be picking and choosing out of this list thinking, okay, well, I can see where I'm guilty with this and maybe that one, but I'm not quite sure my hands are defiled with blood. That's the way the Pharisees reason. They, the Lord said to them, you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder. But I say unto you, this is what the Lord was telling them, if you so much as tell somebody, raka which could be something as simple as, you stupid idiot. I, I hate what you've just done. In your spirit, you've just murdered that person. And so, hands defiled with blood. You see, there's none that can read this and escape this indictment. Your fingers with iniquity, your lips with, uh, have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered, hath, uh, muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Look at how this is put. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of her eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity. Circle that in your Bible. Anybody that thinks somehow God can accept any work of man's hands, it would be like trying to cover yourself with the web of a spider and call it a garment. <laughs> Boy, talk about a see-through garment. You're, all you're going to see is sinfulness. 
and the act of violence in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. See, unless God is pleased to reveal the way of peace, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, man will never know. Never come to Christ. John said that in John 6. None can come to me, he said, of Christ, unless the Father draw him, unless it be given him of the Father. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. If God simply leaves sinners to themselves, they'll never know peace. All that man can do is make for himself crooked paths. And any that are left in that path will only know condemnation. I know people today are pursuing a religion of works, thinking that somehow they can rebuild this path to God. But Christ said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go therein. Don't look at the masses. Don't look at all of what men are doing by way of their works religion to think, oh, well, that's, there's a crowd there and I'm going to go with that because that must be, truth must be with the majority. No, it's never been with the majority. Christ said, narrow is the way that leads, is the gate that, that leads to eternal life. It's just as narrow as Christ himself. And that gate swings on one hinge. And that is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood alone. And that gate you can't even open of yourself. You're so weak and dead. The Lord must open it and bring you through. But he does so for those for whom he has paid the debt. You know, Paul quoted here from Isaiah 59, 7 and 8. Over there in Romans 3. 15 to 17. If you go over there, you'll see that he quotes exactly from Isaiah 59, 7 and 8 here. And he used this passage connected with other Old Testament passages to demonstrate that man isn't just a sinner from time to time, but from head to toe. Every aspect of our being is nothing but sinfulness. And this is how God declares it. But let's go on here in verses 9 through 11 and see then the effects of this sin. It says, Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity, for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind and we grope as if we had no eyes. See, the problem isn't physical eyes, but spiritual. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in de desolate places as what? Dead men. Dead men walking. We're talking about dead spiritually. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation but it is far off from us. I can say that from this point, Isaiah writing, it was as far off as 500 some years before Christ would come and pay the sin debt. But there were already those at this time because of the spirit showing them their sinfulness. They roared like a lion. They cried after God's judgment that he would be merciful and gracious and so what the Lord is showing here then is the effects of sin, how grievous it is. This goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. That fall was conceived already in their heart even before they partook of the fruit. But they could not have imagined, even though God had said, the day you eat of it, you shall die. And Adam and Eve both lived many hundred years, so they 
didn't die physically immediately, but immediately there was spiritual death. It says when their eyes were opened, they saw that they were naked. They saw their nakedness, which represents shame and how they needed then the Lord to intervene, which he did when he slew those innocent victims there in the garden and clothed Adam and Eve. That was the beginning of the type and picture of Christ slain since the foundation of the world. It's the way it's put in Revelation 13, eight, not before. He had no body before the foundation of the world, no blood to shed. There was no sin before the foundation of the world, but sin being brought in, it set now the time clock in motion that as this sin grew, because every time a child was born in the world, sin was brought into this world again. But counting down to that day when Christ himself would come in the flesh and earn and establish righteousness that God might be just to justify. But here they recognize there in verse 9 that judgment is far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. That would be the case for any of us unless the Lord by his spirit gives us eyes to see. And that any justice that was to be done on behalf of any sinner that God purposed to save had to be worked out in time and in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and in his finished work. So those are the effects of sin that we see. And you can see here in verses 12 through 15 where the Lord did bring some here, Isaiah himself, identifying with these to confess their sinfulness. That's what the Spirit of God does. He says in verse 12, our transgressions are multiplied before thee and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us as far as for our iniquities, we know them. So this is definitely referring to some in Isaiah's day, though not many, that the Spirit of God began to cause to see their sinfulness and cause to see that the problem wasn't with God, it was with them. And in transgressing, verse 13, and what? Lying against the Lord. Most people worried about what they do to each other. No, this, every sin is before the Lord. And what? Departing from our God. To seek any other way of salvation than the way that God himself has established through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is to depart away from our God. Speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the head or from the heart words of falsehood. And judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off for truth has fallen in the street and equity cannot enter yea truth faileth and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey and it says what the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment this is where we begin to see now the rest of the chapter going toward how God has purposed to establish justice and where man has taken and turned it into perversion, utter falsehood, yet for those that God has purposed to save, he will set it right by pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see then the hope they know it, as it says here, and I, I'd say that's with regard to those in whom the Lord deals. They know, as it says in verse 12, their iniquities. They know their transgressions. They're brought to confess these before, before the Lord. And then wait on him. So you don't twist God's arm into saving you. But I know this, if he's been pleased by his spirit of grace to reveal your sinfulness in you, 
It's for one purpose, that your eyes might be turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we see in the last part of this chapter, the salvation. We've, we've spent all this time talking about the sin, how grievous it is, but the salvation and redemption as the Lord sees it, as the Lord has purposed it. Here in verses 15 and 16, it says the Lord, last part of verse 15, the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment. In verse 16, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, what? His arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. So here we see really down through here, three aspects. We see what the Lord saw in verses 15 and 16. We see in verses 16 to 19 what the Lord did, what action he took, and then in verses 20 and 21, we see what the Lord said. That's what makes a good little message in and of itself. But what did the Lord see? Well, it's, it says, first of all, that he saw the condition of the sinfulness of the sin of his people had displeased him that there was no justice. Here we see then the Lord knowing us. Nothing is a surprise to him. And yet there are some that treat this as if, oh, well, God knew it all along. So no displeasure. There's some that even say that those that he elected from before the foundation of the world, that he's never been displeased with them. They've always been justified. Well, that's not what the scriptures teach. Here, speaking of this people, looking upon their condition as sinners, it speaks, and this is God declaring how he sees it. It is to his displeasure because there's nothing in sin that can ever bring pleasure to God. And so, even as it's put there, he saw the sin and it displeased him, but he also saw that there was no man. And this is human language. This is to help us understand God's thinking, if you will, but he wondered that there was no intercessor. Not only was the state of the people bad, but no one among them even that would be able to take up the matter of intercession before God on behalf of the people. Why? Because all were sinners. That includes even Isaiah. He couldn't put himself in that place, nor any of the prophets of old. No intercessor could be found. If you want to know why it is, it was necessary that the Lord Jesus Christ come into this world. Here it is right here. That because all have sinned, did sin come short of the glory of God? It required one sent of God as the intercessor that would plead the case of the people before God as an advocate. So that's what the Lord saw. And then in verses 16 to 19, we see what he did. And he saw that there was no man and wondered. You see that in verse 16. Therefore, see the second part of verse 16. His arm brought salvation unto him. Salvation's not a bridge that God's put down and now hopefully men find it can get across. No. Salvation is described as God's arm of strength reaching down and taking sinners. And his righteousness it sustained him, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. You say, who's this speaking of here? This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is forward-looking to what the Lord Jesus Christ would do in coming as a man according to their deeds Verse 18, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, 
to the islands, he will repay recompense. You say, how did he do that? Well, in the person of his son, every misdeed, every sin, all of sinfulness was put upon him. It had to be reckoned with. He didn't just come down here to show the way. He is the way. He didn't come just to tell the truth. He is the truth. He didn't come just to point to himself as the life. He is the life. And so this speaks of his work as the substitute. When it speaks of according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay. This is not talking about him judging people for their sin. It's in the context here of salvation. How have the deeds of those that God has purposed to save been, been repaid or judged in his son? And it says so, verse 19, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood. The spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Think about what the enemy was that stood against us. Not only the world, not only the law, that was our enemy, not only Satan, he's the enemy, but our own flesh, all that we are in our sinfulness. But when that enemy would come in like a flood, and how did it come in like a flood? It came in against the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it says the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. What's that word standard? That means the Lord Jesus Christ stood up. And he bore that curse that we deserved. And uh, bore it in his flesh unto death. So that's where we see what the Lord did. His arm brought salvation. In bringing his son into this world. He put on righteousness. As a breastplate in verse 17. The helmet of salvation. Reminds you a little bit of Ephesians 6. Doesn't it? When it's talking about the armor. The spiritual armor. That's Christ. Every, every piece of that armor is Christ. That's why Paul calls it. The whole armor of God. And it, it is given to. Those for whom he paid the debt. And therefore. They're saved. And so shall they fear the name of the Lord. This is when the spirit of the Lord is revealed in those sinners for whom Christ paid the debt. Notice from the west and uh, his glory from the rising of the sun, the east. That's speaking of all of his elect throughout time when the spirit is pleased to reveal Christ in them for whom Christ died. That uh, they will be raised up and drawn to him. And so verses 20 and 21, to complete this chapter, what the Lord said. He saw what he saw, what he did, but what did he say? Here he said, the Redeemer shall come to Zion. And unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith, saith the Lord. See what he said. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee. And my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart of, out of my mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forevermore. That's just simply a way of saying that whatever God has purposed, and whatever he's promised, it shall be. There will not be any lack in anything that he has declared. When it says there in verse 20 that, the Redeemer shall come to Zion. That word Redeemer is the same word Goel in the Hebrew. It's used of Boaz, who was the kinsman Redeemer of Ruth. And what did Boaz represent for Ruth? Everything. She would not have had any place in Israel had it not been that Boaz took, his, took her case upon himself and went to the gate for her. And uh, did all that was necessary according to the law. That she might then be brought into the commonwealth of Israel. And we know that the Lord was pleased with that work of Boaz. Because actually Ruth is listed in the name of the descendants of the Lord Jesus Christ. As 
being of that seed that would come from her. And I believe that's what it's talking about here when it says that this word out of God's mouth would not depart nor out of the mouth of thy seed or out of the mouth of thy seed's seed. It's talking about all those that God has purposed to save and to turn from their transgression. You see in verse 20, well, the only way we can turn is by the Spirit turning our hearts to him who bore the transgression. And when his Spirit is upon us, that's what it is in verse 21, he said, this is my covenant with them. If any are saved, it's because God has covenanted with his Son. That's the term of a will or a testament where he's named the beneficiaries. But he's done it with his Son. And his people, therefore, are beneficiaries because of the work of his Son. But that God, his word is true. We may doubt ourselves, but we don't doubt him. And that's where we look. Oh, how gracious and merciful he is. Aren't you thankful that the chapter didn't end up there just with judgment and sin? But the Lord was pleased through Isaiah to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, even as he continues to do. Though dead, yet he speaks. I'm thankful we have this word. Amen. <laughs>